Have I hurt you? No. Are you angry with me, darling? No. Will your wife ask you? Don't think so. Doesn't she ever? You have a beautiful back. Do you love me, Tony? I think so. Could you spend the rest of your life with me? My name is DM. I was the examining magistrate in the Falcone case before it went to the Court of Assize for trial before a judge. Back in the mid 60s. The case has haunted me ever since. Did Andre often bite you? Occasionally. How many times? In all, I only met her eight times at the Hotel de Voyageur. Your brother's hotel? Yes. Eight times over a period of uh, 12 months? 11 months. Yes, 11 months. In the Blue Room. What was so special about the Blue Room? The walls. Blue like those little bags of powder my mother used to put in to whiten the linen. And blue like the sky. You're a handsome man, Tony. You're still bleeding? It's almost stopped. If she asks you about it, what will you say? I'll say I bumped into something. I know. The windscreen. Had to jam the brakes on suddenly. Did it never occur to you that she might have a motive in biting you? What motive? I was too busy just living. Could you really spend the rest of your life with me? Of course. Can you be so sure? <laughs> Aren't you a little afraid? What is there to be afraid of? Can't you just see us together, day after day? We'd get used to it, in time. Used to what? To one another. When I think of all the years I've wasted because of you... Because of me? How old were we at school? Six? And we've had to wait till now. Seriously, Tony, if I were free, would you get your freedom too? What was that you said? If I was able to get my free... What is it? Your husband. Nicola? Yes. Where is he? What's he doing? He's crossing the square. Is he coming here? Definitely. How does he look? Where are you going? I mustn't stay here, so long as he doesn't find us together. I had the police transcripts and the psychiatrist's report in front of me. Two big dossiers. But I wanted to hear from Tony Falcone himself. So we went back to the beginning. When you saw her husband coming out of the station, you were worried? Yes. No. A little bit. Which? Well, he was such a creature of habit, and not very well. He fussed about his health. He was epileptic? Yes. And André was married to your friend? Nicola wasn't my friend, or anyone's friend, really. You went to school with him? Her maiden name was Formier, and she lived in the chateau with her mother. A very run-down chateau. Her father was a doctor, and the Germans got him. He died in a concentration camp and became a hero. And André's mother? Had lots of airs and graces. Not much money, still. André's was a different world from mine. And the Despierres, Nicolas' family? They had a grocer's shop. His mother was a widow, too. She was a good businesswoman. She had a clever peasant brain. She thought that Nicolas marrying André would put her a cut above the other shopkeepers in Saint-Justin. She'd be on a par with Madame Formier, even. You are an agricultural engineer, Monsieur Falcone. Yes. Self-made businessman. 
You returned to the village four years ago to make a home for your wife and child. Yes. Andre and Nicola were married. How did you feel about that? Nothing, really. You and she hadn't been intimate before? No. Not even a flirtation? Not even a kiss? It never occurred to me. Why not? Because she was too tall. What? Like a statue. She wasn't meant for me. You renewed your acquaintance, then? By accident. I drove past her on the road. She'd had a puncture. I helped her. And? You'll be late getting home for dinner. Well, you know how it is with my work. I'm often held up. Doesn't your wife mind? She knows it's not my fault. Where did you meet her? Paris? Poitiers. So you go for blondes? I don't know. Never given it a thought. I wondered if you were scared of brunettes. Why should you think that? Because in the old days you kissed pretty nearly every girl in the village. Except me. It was an oversight, I dare say. Would you like to kiss me sometime? What? Well, would you? It went beyond a few kisses. It went beyond... beyond kisses. Will you? Will you, Tony? Come on, just, just do as I say, come on! Where? In the bushes. We'll be seen. No, we won't, just do what I say. I want you, Tony. I want you so much. I never dreamed she could be like that. What do you mean? Well, I thought she was reserved, frigid, like a mother. You took her at the roadside? She took me. Was she embarrassed afterwards? Anything but. Thank you, Tony. And I've been waiting for that since I was 14. Oh, how I used to hate those girlfriends of yours. I'd lie awake at night planning ways to make them suffer. Don't you think we'd better be going? Wait, Tony. No, don't get up. Here in the grass is all very well. There must be somewhere else we could meet. I'm over in Trion every week. Every Thursday. Maybe your brother's hotel. So it was all settled that evening? I suppose so. You suppose so? Things just carried us along. I can't think how else to put it. How did you communicate? She would leave a towel out on the little balcony over the shop. It meant she could get away. Then I'd tell my brother. The blue room? The blue room, yes. Did you believe Nicola was capable of violence? No. But? He was a sick man, an introvert, broody. That day in Trion, did you think he might be armed? No. You were anxious about your wife and daughter? It was like an omen. An omen of what? Were you afraid of Nicola? He always gave me the creeps. Even in your school days? He was different from everyone else. His fits. That evening when you went back home, did you feel that she was lost to you now? Who? Andre? You had been involved for 11 months in what it's surely no exaggeration to call a wild passion, wouldn't you call it that? I desired her. Your wife, Giselle, would you describe her as reserved? Yes. Secretive? I wouldn't say that. She didn't like drawing attention to herself. She didn't want to be in the way. To be a nuisance, she asked nothing of anyone. Was she always like that, even as a girl? I think so. Hmm? Well, after a film or a dance, if she was thirsty, she wouldn't mention it, just so I didn't have the expense of buying her a drink. Did she have many friends? Only one. A neighbour, an older woman. They used to go for long walks together. What was it about her that attracted you? I don't know. I've never really thought about it. You felt... Safe with her, is that it? I thought she would make... A good wife. Yes. Did you love her? Were you intimate before marriage? No. Did she attract you physically? I married her, so she must have done. Could you really spend the rest of your life with me? Of course. Can you be so sure? Aren't you a little afraid? What is there to be afraid of? Can't you just see us together day after day? We'd get used to it, in time. Seriously, Tony. If I were free, would you get your freedom too? 
Are you asking me to believe that you never contemplated divorcing your wife? It's the truth. Not even towards the end? Never, at any time. Yet you told your mistress... Don't you see? I didn't say anything. Not really. She did the talking. She was lying naked on the bed. I was standing naked in front of the mirror. We had just... But you know that as well as I do. At such times, words don't mean a thing. I scarcely even heard, you know? I just nodded. I didn't mean to commit myself. I, I was thinking of other things. What, for instance? I don't know. Then you decided you'd go on holiday. You, Giselle, and your little girl, Marianne. In two weeks. Just the three of us. We take it easy on the beach. How did you feel about that? Feel? I felt it was going to be all right. I'd had a great weight lifted from me. I saw how close I'd come to disaster. Disaster, you say? You loved your wife? Yes. But there was some kind of barrier. It was a marriage. Why did you have no more children after Marianne? I don't know. Did you not want them? Yes. You had plenty of opportunities, the two of you. At the beginning, anyway. Then Giselle got pregnant. Was that when you began going with other women? I should have done that anyway. You mean you couldn't do without it? I don't know. You often say, I don't know. I can't answer your question. About wanting women? Aren't all men the same? Tell me, Tony, if I were free, would you get your freedom too? I was wondering, Monsieur Falcone, when you first suggested this holiday to your wife... It was just after she'd mentioned that Marianne was pale. Yeah, I'm aware of that. Let's say you saw your chance and leapt at it. Excellent opportunity to quiet my suspicions, to reassure her. You playing the devoted husband and father, the family man. What do you say to that? You've got it all wrong. You had already made up your mind not to see your mistress again. I hadn't made up my mind about anything. In the months that followed, did you see her at all? No. And what about her? Did she not put out the signal? The towel over the balcony? I don't know. You don't know? From then on, I never went near her house on a Thursday morning. And all this for no better reason than that one afternoon you saw her husband walk across from the station to the hotel to order himself a glass of lemonade on the terrace. Yet here, according to your own story, here was the woman with whom you had known ecstasies of physical love, the like of which you had never dreamed of. In your own words, if I'm not mistaken, it was a revelation. If you say so, if that's what it says there. What was the holiday really like? I got snappy with Marianne. With Giselle, I think I was sometimes unreasonable. Yes, I thought about the blue room. Sometimes it had me clenching my teeth with longing. Are you happy now? My happiness doesn't come into it. I'm trying to be honest with you, to tell you everything. Everything? Yes. Would you describe yourself as ambitious, Monsieur Falcon? Well, when I married Giselle... I began thinking about a business of my own. The firm in Poitiers I worked for, they imported tractors and so on from America. Those came in sections and we assembled them. It was a good living. Mm, your brother followed much the same course, didn't he? Dabbling in one thing and another and eventually deciding to set up on his own with the hotel. Yes. I wonder whether the fact that you and your brother were the children of Italian parents, foreigners in a French village, your, your father was a bricklayer, I believe. Yes. Tell me, Monsieur Falcone, why did you choose to come back to Saint-Justin after... how long away? Ten years? Perhaps it was because of my father. He's been a widower for so long. You saw very little of him? About once a week. At your home? I think he found Giselle. She overawed him a bit, so I visited him instead. And then there was my brother in Trion. You're settling here. It had nothing to do with André. You're quite sure of that? Not again! You were aware of her marriage to your school friend, Nicolas? Not friend. No, it was a complete surprise. But the mothers had nothing in common. Except wanting the marriage, as you said earlier. Nicolas' mother acting from social ambition, or from spite, perhaps, and André's mother. Had she any inkling, I wonder? Inkling of what? That her daughter might soon be a rich widow. Anyway... It would appear that Nicolas suffered a good deal from bullying at school. He had seizures. Those epileptic fits? Yes. Until he worked out when they were likely to come, and he kept away for a few days. So they were common knowledge? No one ever spoke of it in his mother's presence, and the subject was forbidden in the shop. Why? We just didn't talk about it. Because there was some shame attached to it? That made things awkward for him, anyhow. He didn't go to senior school... 
and he got out of military service. Never went to a dance hall, didn't ride a bike, couldn't drive the car, couldn't drink wine, stuck to his invalid food. Did you never envy him? <laughs> Why should I do that? Envy him as well. When you learned of the marriage, did it not seem as if he had bought André, or rather that his mother had bought her for him? I didn't believe she could love him. I felt a bit sorry for her, being brought up in a chateau, even a run-down one like that. You had to keep up appearances. Mm -hmm. Presumably, knowing those two mothers, some hard bargaining must have gone on. Presumably. How did Madame Despierre and her daughter-in-law get on? I imagine your sources will have told you. I would like to hear from you, Monsieur Falcone. Everyone knew. You tell me. Madame Despierre was in a bungalow, overlooking the garden. She cooked for them all. She stayed on in the shop. Alongside André? Yes. But they ended up not speaking, and Madame Despierre went home for meals. Nicolas went to see her alone. How do you know this? André told you? Told me how? In the blue room. I never asked her. No? No, not once. You were kept busy in the blue room. We were apart from all that. For a while... We could forget. One of the Paris newspapers had a headline, The Frenzied Lovers. <sighs> You had decided not to see her again. It would be wrong to say I'd decided anything. Were you perhaps influenced by the fact that she had communicated with you by other means? I had no communication from her. <sighs> On September the 5th, you received the first letter. What do you mean? I don't know of any letter. It was addressed to you in block capitals and postmarked Trion. I don't remember. Monsieur Bouvier, the postmaster, made some remark to you about this particular letter. I said that looks like an anonymous letter, Tony. That's how anonymous letters are always addressed. Doesn't that ring any bells with you? Everything is fine. Don't worry. The following week there was a second letter. To all outer appearances it was identical to the first. The postmaster made a joke of it. Well, well, he said, maybe I was on the wrong track. This begins to look more like an affair of the heart. I haven't forgotten. I love you. Thinking back to that month of October, Monsieur Falcone, do you honestly claim that you were not expecting some new development? It was a very wet month. That has a bearing, does it? Well, it was uncomfortable. Everything. The atmosphere. Nothing specific. I Have just... you no recollection of the third letter either? Monsieur Bouvier's memory is better than yours, it seems. According to him, you received it like the others on a Friday. That has a bearing, does it? You told me that your assignations took place on a Thursday. Another letter. Soon. I love you. You burned these notes and the later ones, I presume? If my experience is anything to go by, you will soon realise that you cannot persist in denying knowledge of these letters, except on this one point I have been impressed by your candour in answering questions. As things stand, you are denying yourself a valuable opportunity. What opportunity is that? To clarify your thoughts and feelings during those last few days of October. I couldn't anyway. Couldn't what? Tell you what my thoughts and feelings were. I was trying not to think. I had, I had no appetite. Giselle was always asking me, aren't you hungry? Can you account for your listlessness? No. I just carried on with my business. Leaving home and coming back again. To Giselle and Marianne. All Saints Day. Hmm. According to the Inspector of County Constabulary, you set out for the church hand-in-hand hand with your daughter at about ten o'clock. That's right. So you went past the grocer's? Yes. Looking to the upstairs window? No. Because you had lost interest in André Despierre? Because you considered your relations with her at an end? I think so. Or was it that you had no need to look up because you knew what to expect? I didn't know. There was quite a crowd gathered outside the shop. Well, there were always a lot of people about in the square before High Mass. When did you learn that Nicolas was dead? Just before the sermon. What were your reactions? It was a great shock to me. Did you notice that after this announcement from the pulpit, several people turned around to stare at you? No. A special constable has given a statement saying that's exactly what they did. It's possible. Well, I can't see how anyone in Saint-Justin could have known. Known what? About my relations with André. At home, you told your wife the news, I presume? Marianne did. How did your wife take it? She asked me, is it true? She told me he had served her himself only yesterday morning. 
I will outline the course of events in the grocery. Nicolas Despierre had suddenly got nervy and taciturn, how he did before an attack. Dr. Riquet was in the habit of prescribing sedative tablets for the condition. Old Madame Despierre called to see her son at eight o'clock and saw the signs. She told André she was feeling unwell herself with flu. Now, Dr. Riquet, who seldom leaves the village, he chanced to be away with his wife that night, visiting his sister, as I believe he had informed Nicolas. At three o'clock in the morning, your friend André telephoned the doctor's house as though she were unaware of his absence. There was no one to answer but their maid. André de Pierre chose not to call a doctor from the town. Instead, she went across the garden in her dressing gown to wake up her mother-in-law, and by the time the two women got back to him, Nicolas was dead. Too late for a doctor now. It was eleven o'clock the next morning before Dr. Riquet saw Nicolas. After a cursory examination, he signed the death certificate. As he told us, nine out of ten doctors would have done the same in his place. Next morning, though, the village was buzzing with rumours. Were you not aware of this? No, no, I wasn't. In all sincerity, Falcone, do you really imagine that your wife could have been ignorant of what everyone else knew about you and André de Pierre? Surely she too must have been expecting something to happen. We had never discussed any of my adventures. You claim that you didn't see your mistress once during the whole of that winter, Monsieur Falcone. I may have caught sight of her in the distance, but I can swear I never saw her to speak to. You didn't meet at your brother's place? Of course not. Did you discuss the matter with your brother? Yes. He advised me to drop it. Those were his very words. I told him it was over and done with long ago. He said, over and done with for you, maybe, not for her. In the Blue Room, you had discussed your future together. It was just talk. It didn't mean a thing. Not to André, either? Are you quite sure? Can you be so sure? Aren't you a little afraid? I must remind you that two months before her husband's death... She was already planning for the time when she would be rid of him. But that's only how you... so many words, perhaps. Still, that was surely the implication when she asked you what your attitude would be if she were a free woman. The De Pierre estate was now jointly owned by the two women. André could put it up for auction and claim her half, if she had decided to, if you had wanted her to. But Madame De Pierre always said no stranger was going to get their hands on her property. No wonder you were stared at. People wanted to know, whose side is he on? So you say. Andre with her condescending manner, Tony Falcone with his Italian blood, and coming back here, why did he do that? Where does all this get us? Nowhere in particular, except that a lot of people believed that Andre would sell out, even if it meant a lawsuit. And she was only waiting to lay her hands on the cash to leave Saint-Justin with you at her side. The one person everyone was sorry for was your wife. So you tell me. At the end of December, there was another letter. Happy hour, year. You have no recollection. And a final letter on January the 20th. Over to you. Did you intend to marry André de Pierre? No. If you had both been free, unmarried... It would never have entered my head. The postmaster, oh, Monsieur Bouvier again, provided the examining magistrate with a statement. He saw you opening the envelope and reading the letter. I'd never seen him look like that. He was like a man who had received the death sentence. He stared at me, or rather, through me. It must have been an alarming communication. Over to you. She had been waiting all this time for her Tony, and she had shut out everything that might distract her from her obsession. Tell me, Tony, if I were free... She had been free for two months now, free and rich. Would you get your freedom too? Then the train whistle blew. Yes. Maybe she convinced herself I said yes. I turned my head. She might have thought I was nodding. Over to you. Would you have divorced your wife? Certainly not. She wouldn't have allowed you? I had no intention of divorcing her. We were going to grow old together. Over to you. Over to you. Did you think André had killed her husband? Why should I? That's what most of the village thought. And Giselle too. No one could say what really happened. OK, so she hadn't gone for help when Nicola was dying. Look, I had no hand in it. You were no longer lovers. No! But there was no escape from her. You could have left Saint-Justin. No, I couldn't. 
I was still paying for the house, the shed, the equipment. I was able to give my family a decent life. What did you tell your wife? Giselle. I told her how lucky I was. That I hadn't treated her as she deserved. I told her how happy I was. You must forgive me for repeating the question, Monsieur Falcone. For the last time, did you receive those letters? Andre Depierre has admitted to writing them. She has disclosed their contents and her reasons for writing them. I have a transcript taken before witnesses about that last letter. Over to you. Monsieur Falcone, you've persistently refused to admit the existence of this correspondence. Is it to spare your mistress, or because you consider the letters damaging to yourself? I see you have other questions for me. We have reached February the 17th, Wednesday. Yes. It's a significant date? Oh, yes. It was fated. The end. The end? Of? Of everything. Perhaps that was why, finally, he admitted knowing about the letters. We were in the land of his nightmares now. The man was at the mercy of the law. Denying the letters for weeks had been a disaster for him. Will it help if I put specific questions to you? Did your wife ask what your movements would be? I did tell her the night before that I had a very full day ahead, that I wasn't going to be home for lunch and I might be late for dinner. Did you tell her where you were likely to be at any time? I just mentioned the fair at Ombas. I was to meet a customer there and I had a repair job waiting for me at bolin sur sievre You've said... At seven o'clock you went to wake your daughter. Did you often do that? Most days. You wore your best suit, a blue suit which was usually kept for Sundays. Because I now had an appointment in Poitiers. I wanted to look my best to impress Garcia. I'll come to Garcia. You asked your wife, didn't you, if she wanted anything from the village? No! I told the inspector I didn't! I was leaving the house when Giselle called me back. She said, Do you mind getting me two pounds of sugar and a couple of packets of soap powder from the grocers? Then I shan't need to get dressed. Her exact words. Did you often go shopping for her? She had a lot of ironing to do. She wanted to get started. So, after you dropped your daughter at the school gates... I had to go to the post office. And then? I went into the grocers. How long was it since the last time? Two months or so. You didn't go there at all after you received the last letter, the one which said... Yes, I know. ...over to you. No, I hadn't been back. What were your feelings, Monsieur Falcone? Distress? Apprehension? Not exactly. I would have preferred not to meet André, especially with other customers looking on. Were you afraid of giving yourself away? I was embarrassed. Was old Madame de Pierre there? I didn't see her. Were you kept waiting? No. André asked me straight away, what can I do for you, Tony? So she served you before the other people? Yes. And didn't anyone object? It was the usual thing. Men are served first in most shops. And what? I said, two pounds of sugar and two packets of soap powder. And? She got the things from the shelves. Then she said... She said... One moment, Tony. That plum jam your wife ordered a couple of weeks back. It's just come in. Go on. She went off to the storeroom and came back with a pot of jam. Was she away long? Not very. No longer than I would have expected. Did she appear agitated? I wasn't really looking at her. You heard her voice, though, so how did she... I think she was pleased to see me. Did she say nothing more to you? As I went out, she called after me. Have a good day, Tony. Did you notice anything unusual in her manner? I wasn't paying much attention at the time. It was just an ordinary day, like any other. And afterwards, looking back on it. I thought she did perhaps sound especially affectionate. Was André often affectionate towards you? Yes. It's hard to explain. It was a special sort of affection. It reminded me of the way I sometimes felt about Marianne. Maternal. 
not quite. Protective would be closer to it. We have three coincidences here. Your wife sends you to the grocer's instead of going herself. Yes. A certain make of jam, which no one eats but herself, is out of stock for several days. A fresh stock conveniently arrives on the day you go into the shop, and a jar of it is handed over to you. Yes. On that day of all days, you don't go straight home. You call first at the railway station. I had ordered a piston by express delivery. You parked your truck behind the station against the back wall. Yes. Where you couldn't be seen by anyone. It's the best place for picking the up... The station master stated it was some considerable time before he heard you start your engine again. I wanted to make sure they'd sent exactly what I'd ordered. Another coincidence. When you arrived home, you left your purchases on the kitchen table. Your wife was in the garden, I believe, hanging out the washing. Yes, she was. Did you go out to her? Did you kiss her goodbye before you left? We didn't go in for that sort of thing. It wasn't as if I was going on a journey. I called out from the porch. Expect me when you see me. You didn't tell her you'd got the jam. <laughs> Why should I? It was there on the table for her to see. Did you spend any time in the kitchen? And just before I left, I noticed the percolator simmering on the hot plate. I had a cup of coffee. That, if I'm not mistaken, is coincidence number five, at least. If you say so. You called in to see your brother. I wanted to talk to him. I often talked over matters of business with him. And other matters? He was the only one who knew of my worries about Andre. So you did have worries? Those letters bothered me. Only bothered you? Frightened me. And you had come to some decision, which was why you wanted to speak to your brother? Yes. While his uh, wife was out shopping and the maid was upstairs doing the rooms? Yes. And this conversation... About me going to Garcia. I had a business proposition. By way of talking about André de Pierre. I told him if I stayed on, I was never going to have any peace. Did he not try to dissuade you? On the contrary, he seemed relieved. He disapproved of my affair with André from the start. Let's continue with your movements that day. I went to the winter fair at Ombas. I handed out some prospectuses. Then I went and saw to the repair job at Bolin. Then I went on to Poitiers to my meeting with Garcia. You told your wife you were going to Poitiers? No. Why not? Because nothing was settled with Garcia. There was no point in worrying her unnecessarily. And at Poitiers, your appointment was at 4.30. Garcia... He used to be my foreman when I worked at the factory there. We exchanged family news, and then I put my proposition to him. Did you say anything about the reason why you wanted to leave saint Justin? Only that it had to do with a woman. I knew that he'd saved quite a bit, and he'd often talked of setting up on his own. I had a well-established business to offer, along with a house, the storage shed and all the equipment, plus the goodwill I'd built up. Was he interested? He wouldn't commit himself. He asked for a week to think it over. He needed to discuss it with his wife. In the event of Garcia's accepting your offer, what were your plans? I would have asked the company to appoint me as their representative in the north or east. Alsace, for instance, as far away from Saint-Justin as possible. They would have agreed. I know they think highly of my work. One day I hoped I might be able to start up again on my own. We've almost come to the end, Falcone. You went straight back to Saint-Justin. Yes. You didn't stop anywhere on your way. I felt suddenly that I must get home to my wife and child. I drove very fast. It was dark. You must have seen the lights of Saint-Justin some way off. Did you notice anything unusual? I saw lights on in every room of the house. We never had all the lights on at once. I was worried. I knew there must be something wrong. What did you think could be wrong? I thought something must have happened to my daughter. Not to your wife? <laughs> With a child, there are so many things that can go wrong. You drew up about 20 yards from the house. Half the village was outside our gate. You had to push your way through the crowd. They made way to let me through, but they didn't look as though they were sorry for me. They looked angry, and I couldn't understand it. Fat old Didier, the blacksmith, in his leather apron. He was blocking my path. Stood there with his hands on his hips, spat on my shoes. The police were there. I asked them, Where's my wife? Where's my daughter? The inspector was very unsympathetic. Neighbours are taking care of your daughter. Where's my wife? Where have you come from? Poitiers. 
What have you been doing since you left this morning? We've been trying all over the place to get hold of you. Since when? Since half past four this afternoon. What happened at half past four? We had a phone call from Dr. Rike. Inspector, has my wife had an accident? Just what are you playing at? I'm not playing at anything. They took her to hospital, Signor. I was at her bedside. She was still alive three quarters of an hour ago. What you... She's dead? No. It's a fact. What are these men doing in my house? It's a search, but we've found what we're looking for. I want to see my wife. You'll do as you're told. As from now, Antonio Falcone, you're under arrest. What am I charged with? I'll ask the questions, if you don't mind. Questions. Questions. That's when they started. All the questions. You admit that it was you who brought home this pot of jam? Pot of jam? Yes. Did you hand it over personally to your wife? I left it on the kitchen table. Without saying anything about it? I didn't see any need to. My wife was busy with the washing in the garden. When was the last time you went to your shed? This morning, just before eight, to get my truck out. Didn't you take anything else from your shed? Were you alone? My little girl was waiting take for Take a look me. at this tin, Falcone. Do you recognise it? Must be mine, yes. What does this tin contain? Poison. Do you know what poison, Signor? Arsenic or strychnine, I'm not sure which. When we first moved in, the field where the shed is now was a dump. The butcher used to put his waste there, and even after I cleared the field, there were still rats, and Madame de Pierre... Go one moment, which Madame de Pierre? The old lady or the daughter-in-law? The old lady. She sold me a tin. It's the stuff all the farmers use around here. I, I can't remember it's now. It's strychnine. How much did you put in the jam? That's absurd. When did your wife usually eat jam? At about ten in the morning. You knew all about it, then? You knew all about what? About her habit of eating jam in the middle of the morning. Yes, I've just said. Plum jam. Her favourite? Yes. Do you know how much strychnine is a fatal dose? Four grains. Doubtless you're aware the poison begins to take effect within ten or fifteen minutes. That's when the first convulsions occur. Where were you at ten o'clock, Falcone? Just leaving my brother's place. He can corroborate. While your wife was lying on the kitchen floor, which is where she stayed, alone in the house, unable to call for help, until your daughter got home from school some time after four. So she had to endure six hours of agony before anything could be done for her. Very efficiently planned, wasn't it? Your daughter found her. She rushed out of the house, hysterical. Where were you at a quarter past four, Signor? I was putting off time. Where were you? In a cinema in Poitiers. I want to see her. I want to see my child. Not for the present. Why not? She's my daughter. If we tried to get you to her, you'd be lynched by that mob out there. After they'd finished laying out your wife's body, you were taken in to see her. You didn't go up to her. You stopped a few steps away. You didn't speak. You didn't say a single word. Was this not the conduct of a guilty man, Monsieur Falcone? Well, it was because of me that she was dead. The grand jury decided that Tony and André were to stand trial for the murder of Nicolas and Giselle. Tony scarcely seemed to take it in at all. Nicolas's body had been exhumed. The Poitiers specialist reported finding a massive deposit of strychnine in his stomach. Another specialist in Paris disagreed that this was conclusive evidence of poisoning. The press got to work on the sedative drug that Nicolas would take whenever he felt an attack coming on. The druggist in Trion dispensed the drug in capsules. He admitted they could be tampered with by anyone. I felt Tony no longer cared whether he was found guilty or not. At the trial, he was forced to share a bench with André. I saw her lean across past the guard. Hello, Tony. I doubt if he even heard her. It was as if nothing had any connection with him anymore. The witnesses, even his father and his brother, it could all have been happening to someone else entirely. Then old Madame Despierre was called to the witness stand. She had never approved of the marriage, she said. She didn't deny that she had tipped off her son about the Blue Room assignations. Oh, and the other matter... That anonymous letter which had dropped onto the public prosecutor's desk concerning Giselle Falcone's death, well, she said, anyone could have written that. Now Tony was showing signs of interest at last, about the business of the parcel of jam. Madame de Pierre claimed the parcel had arrived the night before the tragic events of the 17th and that she had put it in the stockroom unopened. She told the court that the following morning she had left her daughter-in-law at the counter and gone home just at the moment when Tony was approaching the shop. 
she was lying. That look she gave Tony, it was open defiance. She couldn't help herself. If she'd admitted she had seen the parcel unwrapped that morning, as it must have been, or better still, the night before, it would have proved that André had had all the time she needed to poison the jam. If, on the other hand, the parcel had been, as the old woman claimed, intact when she left, André could not have done it in the time, barely two minutes, that she kept him waiting in the shop. It was not enough for old Madame de Pierre that André should pay for Nicolas' death. Tony must pay for it too. There was a shocked reaction in court. Only André could top that. I didn't poison my husband. But I might have done if it lingered on too long. I loved Tony, and I love him still. I wrote to Tony. I said, over to you. I only had to wait. I knew I could trust him. We loved each other. The jury gave their verdict. André was found guilty of the premeditated murder of her husband, but not guilty of the murder of Giselle. Tony was acquitted on the charge of murdering Nicolas, but found guilty of the murder of Giselle. The président pronounced sentence. The death sentence for both the accused commuted to a life sentence of hard labor on the jury's recommendation of mercy. There was tumult in the courtroom. I watched as André stood up and slowly turned towards Tony. This time, he couldn't turn his head away. He fixed his eyes on her face, mesmerized. Not even in the blue room, in their most intimate embraces, never had he seen her so beautiful, so radiant. That voluptuous mouth, her smile of love triumphant. Never before had she so completely taken possession of him as she did now, with a single look. And then her voice rang out. You see, Tony, we'll never be parted now. <laughs> <laughs>